Okay, so uh, hi everyone. Um, my name is Graham Miller. I work for the Innovation Super Network and this uh, joining me today is um, Dr. Stuart English from Northumbria University. So welcome to, to this, which is the, um, it's the first in a series of sessions that we'll be running um, discussions around things, well, I guess all things innovation with a number of, of our partners, Northumbria University being one of them. Um, so today's session will focus on um, design thinking. Uh, the, the, you know, it's a methodology. Um, we'll explain more about the concept of design thinking during the session. But uh, without further ado, if I can introduce you to um, Dr. Stuart English from, from Northumbria University. Stuart, would you mind giving the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so thanks, Graham. Um, I'm Stuart English. Um, I'm Associate Professor at Northumbria University. Uh, my, my background is really in industrial design. I trained as an industrial designer and, uh, and when I started my career, I practiced uh, designing products of engineering content, um, everything from child safety seats to uh, marine hardware and satellite communication equipment. And um, then I set up a, uh, a, an industrial design company uh, Glen Elg, um, uh, and we worked on things like innovative packaging, um, really sort of business critical intellectual property as well, uh, exhibition systems, uh, so a whole sort of range of consultancy type activities. Um, at Northumbria, I, I ran the industrial design program for uh, quite a few years, and then uh, I went into um, postgraduate, more, more postgraduate work. I did my PhD in innovation methods. And um, now I'm, um, I'm concerned with uh, the way that design thinking drives innovation in, in organizations uh, and also um, sustainability. And, and I've got also got an interest in self-administered uh, health tech as well and the way that design thinking um, works with self-administered health. Uh, so I had a quite a... Um, uh, a focused uh, kind of career in, in, in design and design innovation. Yeah, yeah it's great. Um, thanks for that, because um, you know, I guess worth mentioning at this point that, that um, Stuart and I have never met before this conversation, so it's kind of, it's all unfolding in front of me and, and, and Stuart as well as we speak. So um, really keen to sort of um, hook up with you and chat more about the SATCOM side, because that's partially my background as well before joining the Super Network. So uh, really looking forward to, to chatting with you about that. Um, in terms of your history, yeah, it sounds great. It sounds like you're perfectly placed to be having this conversation with us today and, and um, you know, clearly a thought leader in the Northeast in terms of, of, of you know, this concept, if you like, of, of the design sprints and, and the design thinking. So, you know, once again, thanks for taking the time out to, to speak with us on this. Um, a little bit of background on myself. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm Graham Miller. I work for... Um, the Innovation Super Network, um, who are an organization, I guess we are the, the sort of um, the connectors of business. We support business with innovation in some way, shape or form. We run things like um, VentureFest, which is a celebration of innovation in, in, in the Northeast. And we host a, a, a number of innovation challenge type events where we use usually as some sort of design thinking methodology um, to, to draw out what the needs are or the challenges that the companies are facing. So um, over the, the past few years, I've hosted and facilitated a number of design thinking sprints um, and sessions, you know, with the kind of larger corporates utilizing the knowledge skills um, of, of Northeast SMEs to solve the problems. Um, so I think between myself and Stu, we've got a, a, a reasonable background in and understanding in this area, and hopefully that will come across as, as, as we, we move on. Um, so I think as we get started, it would be useful, Stuart, if you could um, give us an overview as to what design thinking is, just, just a brief for those people that may be listening that, that don't have necessarily a great understanding of it. Uh, absolutely. I, I think, um, I mean, we, we do, when I would Back when I was uh, an undergraduate student, we used to call it uh, domain independent design, you know. And I think um, Richard Seymour at Seymour Powell has a has a really nice way of describing the different aspects of design. So you know, we we used to practice in in the kind of specialist execution of design, and and um, 
uh, Richard Seymour describes um, d design in two, two ways. Um, one, the specialist execution, the ability to um, make models and make specifications of, um, of, of designs, you know, turn them into um, the reality, turn them into product um, or turn them into systems. Um, and, but on the other hand, the idea of um, polymath interpolation. Um, polymath interpolation is about really understanding the problem from lots and lots of different perspectives. And what happens when you do that is that you get a really um, complex and kind of fuzzy, you, you, you end up with a very fuzzy situation. Um, so it, it, it becomes less concrete. Uh, uh, the, the situation that you're, you're exploring becomes less concrete. Um, and you you end up um, uh, really losing yourself in the in the complexity of that. And so, what design thinking is really about is the ability to be able to be comfortable with that complexity and to be able to navigate it, um, to be able to synthesize the different parts of that complexity, and to be able to uh, draw out new value, new forms of value from that complexity. So, rather than thinking about a situation in a very concrete or very very simplistic way. It, um, design thinking thinks about situations in a, in a very complex, multiple perspective way. Uh, and uh, from that fuzziness, uh, we're able to bring our expertise to that fuzziness and draw out new forms of value. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it, it's, almost, uh, it's almost like, um, well, if you imagine, if you've made jelly, have you ever made jelly? <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> what, so what you do with jelly is- I'm um, looking forward to this analogy already. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, you, you melt it down and, and, and you have this little liquid jelly and then you pour it into a mold. And, um, uh, and, and it's a little bit like, um, uh, design thinking is a little bit, bit like being, being the mold for that jelly. Okay. Uh, so uh, if you imagine a concrete world being, um, being made of, 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 uh, of uh, set jelly, uh, design thinking is, like, is a bit like melting it all down Pouring and pouring into different molds. So it's the same stuff, mm -hmm. um, but it's just configured differently for okay. in order to create new forms of value out of that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. I think more will unfold as well as we go through, you know, more of the, the, the questions and the discussion points. Um, and I'll maybe at the end summarize what, what my take is on that, you know, maybe from a non-academic perspective as well, just, just to, to see if we, we meet somewhere as we, as we go through things. So in terms of design thinking itself, and, and forgive me, what did you, you call it, polymath? Um, well, Richard Seymour calls it polymath interpolation. So, um, okay. so yeah, I mean, he has these two things, which, um, you know, one is about specialist execution, the ability to be able to execute what it is that, you, that you're working on. Uh, and the other is about the, uh, this polymath interpolation. Um, so um, the ability to sort of swim around in the complexity of the problem, um, okay and be confident in order to be able to draw out new associations from that complexity and to be yeah. able to use those new associations to drive new forms of value. Okay, it's certainly a new sort of um, take on it for me or a new description of it for me, so uh, thanks, thanks for sharing that. It, design thinking itself, when did you um, first come across it and what, would, what was the context of that and, and, and how do you feel about it when you first heard of it? Well, I suppose design thinking is, um, well, I, when I was a student, I was at university with uh, people like Tim Brown, um, who went on to be CEO at IDEO in the States. And so you know, at the time, uh, we, had, we had a number of um, uh, lecturers who were, were interested in design as a thinking process. So being an industrial designer, you have a whole, a whole uh, collection of um, capabilities that, that are really about realizing the outcome. Um, but that outcome may or may not be valuable. You know, you may put a lot of effort into creating a product um, that, that may actually not have any value. And so we were also concerned with the kind of thinking behind um, the, the decisions, the choices that we made as designers. And uh, so the thing that was driving all of that was kind of common to all forms of design. It was common to industrial design. It was common to graphic design. Um, it was common in uh, right the way across the board in the school. 
And so we, we came up this, with this term called domain independent design, which was really about um, uh, the, the thinking process of design that dr drove um, the, the choices and decisions we made along the way. Um, and uh, you know, I think uh, people like Tim um, have, have uh, pushed that idea in terms of design thinking. Tim Brown has pushed that idea in terms of design thinking as a, um, as a kind of board level um, uh, strategic um, method or board level strategic um, uh, knowledge field that, that actually creates or, or helps to envisage new forms of um, or, or new strategies in organization. Um, and so um, I think uh, one of the things that, uh, that, that Tim uh, describes in his book Change is, is this idea of design thinking as a, uh, an overlap between technical feasibility, business viability uh, and human desirability. And uh, I think often when we're working with organizations, um, the, the, <laughs> the technical feasibility is often there, you know, that we work with companies who, have, who are maybe science-based, science-led, and they have you know, great technical feasibility. And, um, you know, they may well be multinational organizations who've developed uh, excellent business viability. But sometimes what happens is that, um, because, because they are so skilled in these areas, these are the areas that, that lead the organization. So one organization that we work with, um, it, it's based in time, science, the science route and the business route. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so an organization like this might spend two years developing something based on, on the science um, and then get it to the point where it's tested in the market. And then people say, well, and, uh, yeah, well why do we need this? <laughs> um, so, so the science is brilliant the, the the concept is brilliant but actually as human beings we don't need it um or yeah, does it does it, want it? it and there's a there's a really good example with with procter and gamble png had this uh, uh teeth whitening device uh, um, and so it was a thing that fit it into your mouth and you filled it up with this uh um uh, kind of teeth whitening gunge mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. like a um a boxer's um uh, gum shield sort of thing um you filled it up with this and you put this in your mouth and and bit down on it and it whitened all your teeth but it was very difficult for for um uh users to apply and it was also quite expensive it was also very messy and um uh and they did a bit of research on this and and what they found was that oh well you know what i really want is a really nice smile Mm -hmm. and, and so they thought, well, actually, we don't need a, a gum shield here. We don't need something to go in somebody's mouth and, and then be filled up with this, this gum that whitens your teeth. Um, what we really need is just a tape that goes across the front of your teeth because that's what you need. You know, you need a white smile. Um, yeah. And so that's how those teeth whitening strips came into existence. And suddenly from a product that was expensive and wasn't really doing very well in the marketplace, mm -hmm. they had a, a really successful product. Um, yeah, because yeah. they'd listened to really what was important to the customer. Mm -hmm. um, they'd listened to the customers saying, what I really want is a lovely smile. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and like you say, that is really interesting and, and, and happens so frequently. It's, it's a, there's somebody in an organization that, that runs away with an idea that they have, that they believe is the right, the right idea and the right solution to the problem, but they're not really looking at, the problem and they're not looking at what the buyer actually wants and then they're not sort of which i guess is the whole the whole point of, of what we're talking about here um th this this the whole conversation came about um a colleague of mine had had spotted the article that you had written on design thing shared it with me um obviously i found it very interesting and, and, and you know it's kind of moved on from there in that article you mentioned um human-centered design now, again, I, I, I understand that, you understand that, but just for um, people who may be listening, would you mind giving an overview of what your thoughts are on human-centered design and where that fits in all of this? Well, I mean, it is very much about that, um, that kind of human desirability 
um, leg of design thinking. So if we think about design thinking in terms of technical feasibility, business viability, and human desirability, um, you know, person-centered or human-centered design is very much about that human desirability. Um, because uh, that, that desirability doesn't just come from the, the technical function of something. It comes from the context in which that thing is being used. Um, and so uh, um, in, 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 the, in the right situation, a tiny little uh, innovation, a tiny little development can make such a difference to the user. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what, what, could I, uh, what, what example could I give there? Uh, yeah. if, if you don't mind, I'll maybe jump in on this one, actually, because it, it's, as we're speaking, it's, it's kind of, it, it's, it's at the forefront of my brain. We, we, we ran a program around um, innovation in aging, um, you know, trying to come up with new ideas to solve problems for people that were getting older so that they could live in their houses for longer, be independent for a longer period of time. And, and we looked at a, a number of different levels on that and how to achieve things. Um, we run design thinking sessions and um, we invited the usual that we had the sort of the data analysts there. We had the industrial designers there. Um, we had, you know, all of the, the, the clever innovators and entrepreneurs um on on we we also were we were asked to invite um a group of volunteers who were um older the older generation probably the target market for for some of these ideas that we were coming up with at first we were kind of oh yeah a bit unsure but why not let let's 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 bring these guys along and as we saw things unfold so um you know, a, a very raw example is somebody was suggesting remote controlled devices for um, shutting curtains and opening curtains. Now, the volunteers said, look, it's brilliant. Um, the technology is excellent. It is solving a problem. It's going to open and shut the curtains for us and shut the blinds for us. That's superb. However, if you're talking about us um, prolonging our independence, that isn't going to help because we're not stretching up and using those muscles to pull curtains you know to and from every evening and every, and, and every morning and um, therefore what you're actually doing is you're making you know you're, you're pulling that independence away from us in a sense and we lose that more quickly and that's you know i guess that's going back to your previous point of you know it is solving a problem scientifically it's brilliant um you know we think it's what the people need however the people are telling us this isn't what we need. This is actually going to cause us more problems than it than it's going to solve. So, um, forgive me for jumping in there. It just seemed very appropriate based on, on what we were talking about there. Yeah. Um, now, design thinking itself is this something you believe any business can do? And and uh, yeah, yes, it is. Um, design thinking takes a, a a slightly. So when I see design thinking fail. It's mostly because uh, of the of the standpoint that um, the organisations take on it. Um, uh, you know, if you if you take a if you take a view that the world is a kind of concrete, uh, um, fixed place, mm -hmm. uh, then then it's quite difficult to work with a with a design in a design thinking mindset. And um, uh, so you you would think about that in terms of. Um, a, a, a kind of positivist view of, of reality, really. Um, whereas design thinking, I think, take, takes much more of a radical constructivist view of, of reality in that um, we make our reality and we can make it any way we like. So, so it's less about, um, uh, yeah, I mean, there is a, there is, there's a really good quite quote. Uh, I think it was uh, Buckminster Fuller, um, uh, said that uh, the, the the best way to predict predict the future is to create it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, and I think if you take that standpoint on um, design thinking, it's always going to be more successful. Mm -hmm. If you take the view that um, where you're trying to predict what will happen in the future mm -hmm. or second guess, it's it, it's probably not going to work very well. Uh, but if you take the view that you 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 are empowered to create that future, and that um, the future is what you create, then uh, design thinking can be very effective. Um, 
I think that you know that's not to um, that's not to say that the changing situation or the changing context um, is not important. Sometimes, I mean, particularly at the moment with COVID, uh, businesses are, are have a wildly changing concept context. I work with one um, company that is um, a uh, an exhibition company, an exhibition design company. They make banners, and uh, and they've had to pivot to create banners that stop. Um, the the spread of COVID. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but it took them a while to work that out. <laughs> yeah, there'll have, there'll have been a lot of sort of nervousness over the first few weeks, thinking nobody's going to want banners anymore. Um, but uh, okay, there is absolutely a need. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so it is important to to have a, a an ongoing grasp of a dynamic context in which the, your business sits, because. You know, businesses tend to be set up around about the um, the needs of the time, and um, and they set up systems in order to be able to exploit those needs really, and and uh, that's their financial model. But of course, the the situation changes all the time. It's a very fluid situation, particularly when you have uh, an, an an incredibly um, uh, uh, influential situation like COVID. Um, where uh, the you know it sort of throws the business up in the air. Um, when that when that happens, you you have to very quickly uh, understand the way that the the factors within that situation have changed, and be able to create new possibilities out of that changed situation. So I'm not saying that uh, understand having a really good understanding of the situation uh, um, is not really important. But um, being able to create the future out of that situation and having a mindset that allows us to create that future out of that situation, it is important for design thinking. And I think where that doesn't happen, you know, you can see design thinking sometimes failing. So I, th- I, think, I think it's probably worth mentioning at this point that there are, I guess, two ways of, of, of getting involved in design thinking. Let, you know, let's say I buy... I'm involved with a, a small to medium sized enterprise and um, you know, I, I, I'm say running a data related business. There's a couple of ways of getting involved in it. One is to um, use design thinking as a, as a methodology for coming up with a new product or a new service for, for our particular business. So that is using um, or, or involving several people within the business and maybe a couple of externals to look at, break down a problem, look at a particular challenge in the area and come up with a, a new product or a service based on that. That's very much the internal space. Um, the other is looking at it far more as a, a solution provider, whereby you may have a, a, a large corporate that is, is, is running a, a an innovation challenge or a design thinking session, and they want input from a number of different businesses. So, you know, me as the SME at that point, the data related SME at that point, I'm not leading that particular challenge or that particular design thinking session. I'm involved in it and and I'm contributing to it. And I maybe have some solutions up my sleeve which can contribute to that in some way, shape or form. So I think it's just worth distinguishing there are two different ways of getting involved in that type of activity. Uh, and I think also that um, the, the difference between what in design we call problem space and mm-hmm. solution space. So, um, so what uh, a lot of um, uh, a lot of difficulty comes where where organisations, people, and organisations jump to conclusions, jump mm-hmm. to solutions. So, um, uh, what we try and do in design is separate out the understanding of the problem or the situation. From the solution that you that you base on that that, that you come up with, um, and uh, you know, an organisation will have a really good understanding of certain things. Mm-hmm. They might not. I mean, we we worked with one large organisation recently. They had an understanding. Uh, we we asked them uh, a set of six questions, six six fields of inquiry. We okay. set six fields of inquiry. So a lot of what we do it tends to be based about around about multiple perspective problem framing. So how do we frame a problem from, you know, from the user perspective, from the uh, manufacturing perspective, from the market perspective, financial perspective? You know, how, do we, how do we frame 
that situation from all those perspectives simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, and so we asked this company um, a set of questions uh, split into six different fields of inquiry. They knew absolutely everything about four of them. Mm -hmm. They knew pretty much everything about the fifth and they knew practically nothing about the sixth. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so when we added that in, um, and we found out, so we, uh, we scoped out this, the, the problem or the situation based on all of those six fields of inquiry. Um, what, that led us to some quite different solutions because it added in um, uh, factors on, and drivers that weren't in the original modeling of that situation. Okay. So, and that's all about understanding the problem or the situation. It's what we call problem space. It's, um, <laughs> you know, I, I term it a value arena. You know, what do we need to know? Um, what are all the things we need to know? And not just about the business or the market, but, but much more broadly in terms of the context in which people live, the people that are going to buy this product, you know, how do they live and what do they need? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that breadth of understanding of the, of the problem um, or, the, or the situation is, is a critical part of design thinking. Yeah, once, yeah. You've got that, it, once you've got that, you can then begin to draw out the kind of key factors that frame what your proposition is going to be. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so then you can make some choices about that rather than jumping to those key factors um, straight away or jumping to a conclusion straight away that, that, mm -hmm. that might lead you down two years of development that will get you nowhere. Um, you, you can then um, deliberately frame those factors that, um, that, that you decide amongst your team are important and use the factors to... Um, as, as a frame for um, innovation, really, a frame for ideation. Mm -hmm. so when you come up with the idea, you're, you're then, you're, your idea is then relating to, to all of those things that you found out about. And almost it's like each idea that your team might come up with can then relate to that, um, that value arena, relate to all of those different factors. And all of those different factors will configure around about that idea. So mm -hmm. what it means is that you can practically test that out before you actually make anything, before you actually commit to spending money on developing a new product, you've mm -hmm. tested it and you've evaluated it relative to all those factors that you already know about. So you know by then you, you're, you're fairly sure that that's going to be successful. Um, and, and you get to the point where you can commit your resources um, to, to something that, uh, uh, that you can all agree on and that you could be fairly sure that, uh, that that's the right or good direction to go in. I'm, I'm, I'm going to labour that point slightly in that um, personally, and I know from speaking to a lot of other people about this, um, I, I found this very difficult um, to get my head out of a solution mode when I first started being involved in this type of activity. I think we, we culturally, we look for solutions immediately to problems. Um, we think we know fully, we fully understand the problem, therefore um, it's, it's ingrained in us to try and come up with the solution immediately. It's kind of what we're conditioned to do and what we're taught to do. Um, and, and it's almost a sign of intelligence to be able to come up with a solution straight away. Therefore, you know, we, we try our best to promote ourselves as being intelligent and clever and, and, and have good solutions. When I'm facilitating these sessions, it, it's, it, it, it's something... I mention up front and, and you know, it's, it's a tool I use often, which is um, I'm forever saying at this stage, you know, we're, we're breaking down the problem at this stage, we're ideating, you know, we're still not looking for solutions yet. And I'm going to tell you off if you start giving me solutions and, and it's almost smacking people's hands because they're, they're trying to give you a solution at every single stage of it. And yeah, it, it's, this is much more about breaking down the problem and framing the problem and understanding it. So can't labor that point enough as to what you've just said there. Because I mean, that, that solution that, uh, that you come up with is going to be measured against all of those things that you found out. Yeah, and so yeah. when you come to presenting that solution, when you come to um, uh, making that as a proposition, mm -hmm. you, you are defending it in relation to all of those factors that you found out about in that problem space. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> You know, we, we, we worked with another organization a couple of years ago um, and uh, uh, they, they had solutions, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but 
<laughs> they wanted us to help us to, to help them to uh, to present those solutions in terms of propositions, and and so we we went right we had to go right the way back to finding out about the whole problem, mm -hmm. um, in order to be able to build up the um, the presentation of the proposition. Was that a kind of a validation exercise for them? What do you think? And, and, and yeah, so I mean, that, you know, they they had to. Uh, so for them to go with any kind of new idea, they were you know, a big organization and they would have to invest a lot of money in, uh, in, in it. And so they were trying to, um, they were trying to present or part of their company was trying to present their ideas to uh, the, 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 the main board. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, they were, they were good ideas, you know, uh, but perhaps they had, you know, some, uh, factors of those ideas that were not fully worked out. So we had to go right the way back to the beginning and build it up from scratch. Okay. And one of the things that actually we find as, as designers, you know, often um, in, my, in my life as an industrial designer, um, I would find that a company would come along and they'd, they'd have a clear idea about what the brief, can you design one of these? Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and, and, and we would say, mm, well, do you really want to design that? <laughs> there's a wider problem well yeah, you've yeah. done this and it's a completely different way of looking at it um, <laughs> uh, so so we would go back to something called stage zero which is uh, before you actually start designing anything we would we would be um, making a um, or, or building a value arena in order to be able to say well you know what is the best thing to design in this situation we yeah. don't have to go with um, that you know obvious <laughs> idea we yeah, could yeah. Do it in a different way and, and perhaps doing it in a different way would give you a better advantage mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it sounds like you've had the opportunity to, to really strip things back in your in your past career and, and do things you know the, the, what I would consider the, the, the right way to do it so um, I, 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 I'm interested I mean, I, like I say I've been I've been hosting and facilitating these sessions and sometimes I'm asked to do them over a half day um, other times I'm asked to do them over five days um, as an example so I, I don't know if in your mind and with your experience you, you have a perfect sort of time scale for doing these this and, and doing it properly and I know I guess on occasions you've done them over a period of months is, is there an ideal time or does it depend um, on what it is you're trying I think with any organization that you're working with, an organization and, and any people, um, mm -hmm. they come with expertise, they come with particular expertise. And um, uh, what, what we come with as design thinkers is, is a standpoint and methods to support that standpoint. Um, and so uh, those two things have to come together. Mm -hmm. The expertise of the organization and the standpoint and the methods that we bring um, in terms of how quickly that, that you can teach that, um, I mean, you can teach method, you can teach a method quite quickly, but, um, in order to be able to really, um, master that method, you have to be able to bring the expertise of the individual together with the method. And so I, I would say the more successful, um, uh, interventions that I've been involved in have been, um, have been about training in the methods, but also then bringing in the expertise of the organization and mm -hmm. using the methods with the organization. So quite often we might run um, um, a, work, a, a workshop over maybe six days altogether, um, mm -hmm. where the first part of it will be about training in methods and standpoints. Um, and then we will, then we will, um, uh, ask the participants to to gather lots of information that is around their particular fields of expertise, and um, uh, you know they're all these are all the things that are part of their jobs, um, uh, part of their role in the organisation. And then we'll bring that back and we'll apply all of that data, all of those factors, um, together with the methods that we bring in order to be able to move those organizations on, to be able to understand um, the, the situations that they're dealing with, the problems that they're dealing with in different ways and, and proactively build propositions out of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's putting them in, it's, it's putting them in charge of 
um, uh, the way that the way that they build their expertise and the choices that they make within that sort of fuzzy situation of design. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, um, you know, what we were saying earlier about people jumping to conclusions, people like to jump to conclusions and jump to solutions because it makes them look stronger. Yeah. Um, when you say, well, I don't really know, <laughs> you know, <I'm> <laughs> yeah. information. it's a bit fuzzy, isn't it? You know, it's a bit difficult. And, and, and it has been in the past seen as a sign of weakness as well, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but but um, if you, I think the double diamond, for example, the design council double diamond is a very good way of thinking about this because mm -hmm. the first diamond is about the problem space. Um, so the double diamond really is, is uh, consists of four um, stages. First stage about discover, Second stage about de definition, I mean, defining what's important. The third stage about develop it, development, so that's where the ideation happens. And, and the fourth stage about delivery. Mm -hmm. So the first two stages there are about understanding the problem or the situation. Yeah. And the second two stages are about scoping out and reaching a solution. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I think when, 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 uh, or using the double diamond. I mean, the double diamond is sometimes criticized uh, because um, it's seen as a, uh, a linear process. It's not a linear process, really. It's a framework to understand different activities at different stages. So to understand when you are finding out about something, to understand yeah. when you are defining what's important about those things that you found out, to, mm -hmm. to then um, scope out potential solutions and to link those solutions back to what you found out. And so the solutions, um, uh, when you're in the develop stage, the solutions that you're developing um, will link back to all of those things that you found out. And you may then want to go back and find some other things out because you've realized actually this thing is important. Um, mm -hmm. We need to know a bit more about uh, how the user's gonna uh, interact with this. So we go back and we'll find out a bit more about that. Or yeah. we might decide to slightly change the way that we describe what's important, what's fra what are the framing factors within that. Mm -hmm. uh, because if we slightly change the framing factors, it gives us this space rather than that space. If you think about, um, uh, I, I mean, one of the examples that I sometimes use is designing an innovative iron. So if you think about an iron, mm -hmm. you have a handle and a, and a base plate and the base plate gets hot and you do this and you take the creases out of your garment. Mm -hmm. So if you if you describe something which is about designing an innovative iron you're always going to have a handle <laughs> with a hot base plate and you're going to do this on an ironing board when yeah. in fact what you really want is something to take the creases out of your clothes mm -hmm. uh, so for example a you know <laughs> if i'm going to design an innovative iron i'm never going to come up with a trouser press mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I'm never going to come up with something that does it in a different way because I've already described what it is. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so design thinking is about describing things in different ways to begin with and, mm -hmm. and framing them um, um, out of that complexity in yeah. order that um, we give potential to, to you know, future ideas. We frame future ideas so that... Um, just very simply put on that one, we want something to remove creases from garments as yeah. we want an innovative iron. And, 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 you know, immediately what you're doing is you're focused on the problem as opposed to, you know, putting ideas into people's heads of what the solution would be. So. Yeah. And, and, that, and that comes through that definition phase of that uh, double diamond. Um, you know, you're, you're defining what's important. But, yeah, yeah. but every word or every... Um, uh, every concept, every factor that you include as a framing factor mm -hmm. um, either opens out the scope or closes it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the shape of what you can come up with is really very much dependent on the way that you define the problem or the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Okay, I think um, we'll conclude this. I think we've already supposed to talk for 10, 15 minutes and we, we've, we've, we've gone on a lot longer, but I'm very proud of the fact that neither you or I have, have introduced flip charts or post-it notes when we've been talking about design thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I can see some of the background of your, your frame there, but uh, yeah, we, we've not once gone into a post-it note. <laughs> you know, design, so post-it notes. Uh, post-it notes are very... Um, uh, um, you know, a lot of people criticize post-it notes, but post-it notes have arrived because design thinking is about relationships. It's relationships of different factors. 
And if you can configure things in different ways, you can create new forms of value out of that new configuration. So it's taking that stuff that we've already got and making it in, in, into a different shape. It's like Lego. You know, it's yeah, like yeah. breaking down your Lego toy and throwing it out on the, on the table and building a different shape with it. Yeah, um, yeah. Maybe the different shape is going to be better than the original. It, it was my biggest fear when, when we went into lockdown and, and started trying to do these sessions online was, how am I going to fit post-it notes into all of this? <laughs> how am I going to make post-it notes and flip charts work with them? That's, that's, that's about relationships, you know. That's, yeah, that's another thing. So I think um, just to, to kind of very quickly summarise and, and thank you so much for your, your input and your, your thoughts on all of this. Um, Human-centred design, very important. Um, for getting solutions initially and spending way more time understanding the problem and breaking that, that area down. Um, involving you know, different people, not just the, the designers, it's involving a number of different people in um, the project itself. And you know, I guess to, 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 to clarify that there isn't necessarily a, 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 a time scale we should use. It's not always gotta be six days or three days or half a day. It's what's appropriate for what it is that we're trying to achieve at that moment in time. But um, I think for me, the, the, the key message here is, um, you know, as much about the, it's, it's understanding and framing that problem without coming up with the solutions immediately is probably the, the, the key part in all of this. Yeah, I mean, um, managing it, absolutely managing it. And, and yeah, and following the process and, 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 and managing all of that. So, um, Stuart, thank you, thank you so much. I um, you know, really enjoyed talking to you and, and I kind of look forward to uh, carrying on the conversation offline. We'll, uh, we'll pick up on some of the uh, SATCOM stuff and, and, and other things as well. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Thank you.